Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Leaders Credit Union. Thank you, Zach, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before we get started, tell me something you have discovered today, this morning. I want it to be this morning at Discovery Park of America. Okay. Uh, well, this morning then, I discovered our lineup for the Rhythm on the Rails summer concert series we will be doing here. Did you just really, you just discovered that? Well, I've been doing some preparing for the marketing for that. So, so you didn't I, look until this morning. You waited well, and then you were like, okay, here we, you unveiled it for yourself. Would you share with us of the, how many acts is, how many, it's like 10, 10 nights, uh, 10 Friday nights. I don't remember. Anyway, it's a lot of Friday nights of, of the two acts per night. Who are you most looking forward to hearing perform? It's seven nights, 14 acts. Thank you. Um, Honestly, I'm not a big Elvis guy. I don't listen to it a lot mm -hmm. or, or Jerry Lee Lewis, but we have two guys on June 7th. Uh, Jacob Tolliver does Jerry Lee Lewis and Cody Ray Slaughter does Elvis and they both do them quite well. So I'm interested in that one. That's going to be a lot of fun. I am uh, very much excited about that. Unfortunately, the one night when we're bringing in Memphis, I, we're celebrating Memphis that night too. We're doing all kinds of Memphis stuff. This guy is going to be out of town. This guy's on vacation. Yeah. I am going to have to oh, miss it. But I'm excited. I'll be watching from afar, watching everybody else celebrate uh, the king of rock and roll, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and Memphis, Tennessee. So very exciting. And lots more good acts as well. So definitely come see us. Yeah. In case I was was interested, where could I find out more information on Rhythm on the Rails? discoveryparkofamerica.com slash rails. Oh my goodness. You know, I, I'm very grateful that we changed it to slash rails this year because when it's slash rhythm, like I have to like pause and, and Google how to spell rhythm. So rails is much easier for me. Our very special guest today is chef Dylan Constantino, who is the chef at the new lodge at Paris Landing State Park. Welcome Dylan. Hey, appreciate it, Scott. Thanks, man. I, Zach, thanks for having I'm me. Digging your outfit Welcome. with your name on it and everything and the logo <laughs> of the lodge. That's really cool. It almost makes yeah. me, it kind of has like a Colorado vibe. Like you're uh, the chef at a ski lodge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I used to work at a ski lodge. But, well, yeah, I'm glad you said that. I want to, I want to rewind a little bit and go back to the very, very beginning. We're going to end up talking about the lodge in a minute, but tell me a little bit about you. Where'd you come from? Well, I, um, I grew up in Michigan. Uh, I was born on Staten Island, New York, but I grew up in Michigan. Um, I guess what got me into cooking, uh, like most people in the industry, the traditional learning infrastructure, such as like college and high school, didn't really jive with me. It didn't really work. So while uh, during my college attempt, you know, uh, to help pay for school, and pay for bills and whatnot. I started working part-time in restaurants, um, first as a server, um, and then worked my way up to, I guess, you know, I worked my way up to uh, lead server, floor manager, you know, person in charge when the front of house manager wasn't there, bartender. I bartended for a few years. Um, then I slowly started to gravita gravitate towards the back of the house. Um, I'm not really a people person, um come to find out uh, i have that i find that hard to believe you're uh, you're very charming right now <laughs> well i appreciate it yeah uh to the i guess to the average restaurant the average restaurant customer would probably disagree with you but that's okay that's why i that's why i'm back there now my my specialty is not people my specialty is food but um i you know and, and honestly when i go out to eat in a restaurant you know, I don't need the chef to come out and entertain me. I just right. want to really have a great meal. Yeah, exactly. Nobody wants me out there. Trust me, that's <laughs> the last thing anybody wants. Uh, um, yeah, dishwasher, line cook. Um, what kind of restaurants then, are we talking here? So, like, my first restaurant ever was um, 
uh, a Chinese place I was a server at. Uh, the owner, uh, his name was Grandpa. That's what everyone called him. Um, he was from the Sichuan province of China. So it was uh, Sichuan Chinese. Um, you know, typical stuff, pork egg rolls, hot and sour soup, egg drop soup, wonton soup, uh, uh, a menu a mile long, <laughs> as most uh, Chinese places have. Um, and then from there, it was a little, little Tex-Mex place uh, called El Barrio. Uh, Mexican Grill. Uh, this is all in Grand Rapids, Michigan, by the way. That's where uh, that's where this was taking place. Um, that's where I first started to dip my toes in on the line a little bit at El Barrio. Um, I think from there, I ended up uh, working at Jimmy John's for a while. I worked at Jimmy John's for a few years. I was a general manager of one of those stores. Um, and then I eventually found my way to Mackinac Island. Oh, um, that's nice. I would, yeah, I would say this is really where I like started to get my really got my feet wet and started to gain traction um, in regard to my culinary career. Um, summer resort, really cool spot, you know, uh, no cars allowed on the island. Everyone gets around by horse and bike. Um, it's, so it's kind of like going back in time. It's like living in an episode of the Twilight Zone. Uh, I lived there for a very, very busy summer. Um, first first couple months of the summer spent on the line like a deer in the headlights I was thrown on grill as a lead line cook at that point I had very very little line experience you know most of my experience was front of the house at that point point. and about how uh, old about how old were you in this era? um early 20s I was in my early 20s I was probably 22 23 yeah, when I was in college, I had a lot of friends who worked in restaurants, and I was always fascinated by uh, the culture of restaurant workers because you're working until late, late, late at night. When you finally get off, the only people there are to hang out with are the people that you just spent the whole evening with cooking and serving. And, you know, so there's this really fascinating subculture that goes on, especially in a resort town. 100%. 100%. We were a big, um, happy, dysfunctional, rambunctious family. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. You, you grow very tight with, uh, with your restaurant crew. I mean, you spend more time with them than you do your own family. So mm -hmm. they become your family or an extension mm -hmm. of, so it, it's a, it's a beautiful thing really that, cause that when you have that chemistry, it makes work so much easier, especially in that environment. That can be a very brutal, a very thankless environment and, and it's have, turning over like you constantly it's a new group of folks every week yeah on the island so that it, that means you you don't have yeah. a lot of people that come every single week except for some locals maybe but exactly. it's like like really new audiences to impress mm -hmm. or the opposite every single week yep 100 percent yep. and what kind of restaurant was it on Mackinac island so i worked at cawthorn's uh village inn uh which is owned by the grand hotel Mm, um, which nice. is like, uh, I believe the world's largest privately owned, uh, seasonal resort, um, beautiful hotel. Uh, my, I'm trying to remember, chef Germain was my chef there, small Jamaican fellow, uh, just hothead, you know what I mean? Typical chef. Um, he wanted you to have your head down and he didn't really want to hear anything other than yes, chef, no chef. Sorry, chef. Thank you, chef. That, that was pretty much it. I it sounds like, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, it sounds like the show, the bear. I was Hulu. just going to, that is exactly what I was, are you watching the bear? I, I have oh, very it. much. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that show very much. That <laughs> that show at, right there is that probably the most accurate depiction of mm. our industry huh. that I've seen in the media. Personally, my, my personal opinion. Um, Put your pin down. You're clicking. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a fidgeter. I'm so sorry about that. I, I'm the same way. That's why I have to hold my arms. <laughs> I have to hold my arms when we're doing this. Um, so um, so the bear is is reflective of what you've seen in the industry. Um, you know, the, there's there are two different kinds. I mean, there's many different kinds of restaurants, but there's the the restaurant that stays in at a, in a large metropolitan city and People come, there's right, but then there's the hospitality and tourism business, which mm -hmm. you were a part of then. Um, after that experience, did you, what was your next uh, restaurant gig? So from there, because that was supposed to just be a summer gig, um, I needed to find work for the winter. Um, I found uh, the Four Seasons in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, 
Uh, Jackson Hole is probably North America's most famous ski resort. Oh, sure. Um, known for not only the snow quantity, but the quality of the snow there. Very, very dry powder. It's it's choice, quite choice. I, I highly recommend. But uh, yeah, I worked at, um, I got hired in as a cook three, which is like an entry level cook for them. Um, uh, at a, uh, Michael Mina, Michael Mina owned outlet restaurant in the four seasons called the handlebar, um, which featured this great, big, beautiful patio surrounded by fireplaces and whatnot that literally was at the epicenter of the ski resort. Like all the major ski runs ended right there at that patio. So we were very, very busy. High, that was a high volume restaurant. Uh, and those and folks it, um, have a very high uh, set of expectations, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. Doing. Absolutely. It was a really, the menu was really cool. It was not fine dining. We had another um, restaurant that was actually owned by the Four Seasons that was upstairs. That was the West Bank Grill. That was like your high-end steakhouse. We were more of like um, elevated like opera ski or gastro pub um so you know bar pub food but like slightly elevated you know, what was the some... most frequently ordered uh, uh main course that you prepared there oh i mean probably the handle burger um you know brioche bun truffle aioli uh smoked blue cheese caramelized onions our special like sauteed magic mushrooms is what we called them and that that was a that was a staple there um Let's see our elk chili nachos. That that was something that never left the menu. Uh, so those were extremely popular. And uh, what was really neat about that is that the Mina Group gives their the chefs of their restaurants a lot of creative control. So the the uh, the menu was changing seasonally. You know, we would have three or four different menus throughout the entire year. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It kept things really fresh and interesting. And it also, as a young cook, really drived you um, to learn and like push yourself, uh, which is what I was looking for. Yeah. So the two uh, we've talked about so far were many, many, many miles apart. Yes. Um, you know, were you pretty quick to just travel and just look for whatever, wherever, wherever the next, the next kitchen led you to? I was, yeah. The, the four seasons, I will say, um, I love don't even, I love absolutely love working for the state of Tennessee right now, but one of the best, uh, companies I ever worked for was definitely the four seasons. Uh, they offer their, uh, their employees opportunities for a lot of growth, uh, with, so that restaurant would close for six weeks in the spring and the fall because there's not really much snow. So there wasn't really a lot going on. So, they, they would simply shut down and we would, you could either collect like six weeks of job attached unemployment and you could just go hang out, travel, do whatever your job was promised for you while you, when you came back, um, you could cash in on all your comp time that you had saved up, whatnot, or they would put you on what would they call four seasons task force. And they would send you to another property. It could be anywhere on the planet um, that needed help. And uh, I did that a few times and that was a lot of fun. I was sent to Scottsdale, Arizona, San Diego uh, a couple of times. Uh, yeah. Ton of now fun. what, um, uh, so um, they're famous for their customer service, obviously. Yes. Incredibly high level. You were more working behind the scenes. Did you also have to go through training and learn, you know, what everybody else at the Four Seasons is learning? Oh, yes, 100%. You know, it being a large corporation, you you got to go jump through all the corporate hoops and like orientation such as that. You know, you're given a list of acronyms that help you remember to smile and, and make eye contact with the guest and whatnot, so on and so forth, things like that. Uh, no, a big one is uh, no is not in your vocabulary when it comes to talking to a guest and like in regard to their request, as long as it's not um, morally or ethically questionable, you know what I mean? Like we do not say no. If somebody wants, you know, Belgian waffles in the middle of dinner because they loved them so much off the breakfast buffet that morning, you bet your rear end somebody's running upstairs to the banquet kitchen to grab that waffle iron and to make some waffle mix quick on the fly. And like those folks are getting their Belgian waffles. So. 
Mount yeah, we actually here at Discovery Park at at our uh, at our quarterly meeting, we've been going over some of the customer service uh, lessons from different um, organizations. And interestingly, Four Seasons was uh, the most recent one, and it was really interesting for me to dig into what they teach, what their philosophies are, you know, where that came from, you know, so customer service is, uh, is a, is a really important part of what all of us do in hospitality. So, yeah. Um, so, so where was next? Um, so from there, um, I developed a really strong relationship with a great mentor, um, and dear friend of mine, Michael Lashinsky, uh, chef Lashinsky. Uh, he invited me to, come open up Bourbon Steak Nashville that was opening at the brand new JW Marriott uh, that was being built. Um, he was the he was the the chef de cuisine at the restaurant or executive chef of the restaurant. Um, he invited me out there to be as a CDP or a chef de partie. It's a station leader or a line leader or a station chef. Um, and that man, that was the most intense experience of my culinary career to date. Um, talk about expectations, you know, within that MENA group and especially uh, the bourbon steak chain. Um, shout out to Chef Gerald Chin. He's like head of the steak division for the MENA group. He was one of the most inspiring and just, man, just one of the, the, the best chef I've ever had at teaching. Um, and, you know, that, that, like I said, that was really intense. We're working... 70 80 hours a week seven days a week opening that restaurant going through tons of research and development playing with all these uh menu ideas for super elevated american steakhouse fine dining um uh, i highly recommend anyone checking out a bourbon steak uh, bourbon steak nashville is amazing but i know there's one opening in vegas and there's the one in miami they're all over the place but well and is, setting up incredible. setting up a restaurant um, setting up any business, especially a restaurant and getting it off the ground is a whole different experience. Oh man, it was in intense, intense. And, uh, there'd be days where, you know, I, and I moved out here, I moved out to Nashville with my current wife, Shelly. Um, and she was uh, part of the restaurant, uh, the kitchen staff too. So she was part of that opening team with me. And there'd be times where we'd leave work, we'd get home to our apartment and I'd say, man, I, really don't know if I'm gonna you know go back tomorrow but G Gerald Chin always kept me coming back and that's a that's a big part of a chef's job is um inspiring and like keeping that fire lit in the belly for their cooks you know so I there'd be a day where I would just be burnt out at the end not ready ready to come back and he would deliver a speech that would just make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I'd actually be hungry to go back the next day uh yeah it was great it was great um a lot of athletes foot and a lot of red bulls consumed <laughs> during that point zach have you ever yeah. uh worked in a restaurant i sh i have not worked in a restaurant have you not nope <laughs> there there are things when my kids were growing up i told them working in a restaurant is absolutely the best way to learn every aspect of business i have heard that before 100 from, from inventory yeah. to waste to customer service to inter intercompany relationships i mean it mm -hmm. is like the best md um, masters program that there's out there so it'll teach you a lot of life lessons and like time management Skills, absolutely things like absolutely. that as well yeah 100 so what what did you think was that the first time when you moved there to work that you had ever been to nashville or did you visit it was it before? yeah nope never been you know went in completely blind uh loved the city it was great man i think it's still the fastest growing city in the united states right now what, i mean i was wondering what year you went there um, I would have been, it's 2020. So it was 2018 or 2019. Okay. This is when I moved there. So, I mean, there was a new crane up, you know, set up downtown every single day. There was a new building being built every single day. So you're like us, we're in a business that was severely affected by COVID. So, you know, the restaurant business, of course, you know, where were you working when COVID hit? So, um, luckily for me, so I had just, so at Bourbon Steak, I was promoted to sous chef there, and then they transferred me from the steakhouse to the butcher shop. So then I became senior 
uh, sous chef of the hotel and I fabricated all the meat for the for every outlet restaurant, you know, stopping grounds, the the banquet operation and bourbon steak. Um, and then from there, I actually decided I wanted to take a kitchen hiatus after opening that restaurant and that that uh, those few intense years, I was just kind of burnt out. And I knew if there was any chance of me ever going back, I needed to step away. And that's what all of my mentor chefs had told me. They're like, man, we a lot of people have been there. And what you need to do is just step away. And if it's truly meant to be, you'll, you'll come back. You know what I mean? So I was actually selling cars during COVID um, in, uh, in northern Nashville. Um, and we were deemed an essential business because people have to be able to get around. Yeah. So um it was very very strange as a you know as times were for everyone uh, did you say did that. people buy cars during covid they did they did they bought cars they bought cars but i will say i didn't stay in that industry long because the only business that has worse hours <laughs> yeah than the restaurant is sales yeah. no absolutely because that's when you want to buy a car is on a Sunday afternoon. Right, when, exactly. Uh, when I want to be taking a nap. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back from the break, I'm going to ask you all about how you got to the lodge and for some more details on that. Cool. Yeah, sounds good, man. With nine branches in West Tennessee and nationwide ATM branch access, you can take Leaders Credit Union with you wherever you go. From checking accounts, credit cards, home loans, and their state-of-the-art mobile app, Banking with Leaders can help you move forward. Learn more and see how you can qualify for membership at leaderscu.com. Leaders is insured by the NCUA. I certainly hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America in beautiful Northwest Tennessee. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Chef Dylan Constantine. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Chef Dylan Constantino. So tell us a little bit about um, how you heard about Harris Landing State Park and the opportunity and uh, a little bit more about that. And then we'll also fill folks in a little bit more about the area, which I can kind of help do. But um, uh, how'd you how'd you end up there? Yeah, for sure. Um, (laughs) Kind of a bittersweet story. Uh, actually, so after COVID, after selling cars, I was cutting meat for Publix, another excellent company to work for. Awesome, awesome corporation. Uh, and still living in Nashville. And our apartment burned down mm. one night. Yeah, three in the morning. Actually, the night it was, I had just proposed to my girlfriend Shelly like midnight that night, and a few hours later we we woke up to fire alarms and whatnot. Oh and my our, and our apartment burned down, and um, we really we we were really in a position to fork over first, last, and security deposit uh, for a new place because that's that's ultimately the boat we were in. Um, so we were really blessed and lucky to that her father had just purchased a house here in Paris um and was willing to let us move into it um and so i I moved here uh i did i stayed with Publix for a little bit i was commuting back and forth uh, to clarksville which is about an hour and 20 minutes one way that drive got old real quick so i started applying on indeed any anywhere i could find a job and then one day i got a call from the state of tennessee you know, kind of confused, wondering if I had a bench warrant or something out. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. Do I owe my taxes? Um, but it ended up being, uh, you know, a state representative, uh, Cheryl Gracie. She does all the hiring for the state or a lot of it for the hospitality. And um, she told me about the lodge. Uh, I remember driving past it, you know, to to work at Publix every day and went out there and checked it out. Met with the food and beverage director chris langley a couple times and then the general manager and I, I you know i loved what i saw eventually got an interview and and here i am so uh, for folks for folks who and, and first of all what year uh when, when uh did you start at the very beginning when they opened or had they already been opened when you started so working? they i came in mid to late on their first year i think i i 
my first year was August 28th of 2022. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so it wasn't brand. It was, it was, it had already been opened when you saw They had it. been open. They, I think they did their soft opening in April of that year and they had been uh, officially open since June. So they had just, you know, gotten through 4th of July and whatnot uh, before I'd gotten there. And they were twice as busy as anyone had anticipated or expected. So for, for folks who, you know, there's people listening who've never even been to Paris, Tennessee, um, it is, uh, we're talking about a new 91 room lodge at Paris Landing State Park. Um, it, it's, uh, I, I sound like I'm reading because I am, uh, it provides hotel resort style vacation rentals on Kentucky Lake near land between the lakes. So it's a, it's a more rock modern kind of a vibe, a great conference space, a full service restaurant, which you're running bar lounge, and it all overlooks, um, uh, the land between the lakes, I guess, Kentucky Lake is what it actually overlooks. Um, have you got a boat yet? No, no, not yet. Not yet. Not willing to throw my money into that hole yet. Now, as a, as a, uh, as a young man, um, I spent many an hour water skiing on that lake. Oh, right um, on. Uh, we did not have such a nice, uh, you know, we, we just pitched tents and, and hung out around our food. We cooked, you know, around campfires, um, it's uh, what you're certainly experiencing to go from, you know, to go from Mackinac Island, you know, ski resorts, Nashville, and now you're experiencing rural life around mm -hmm. a lake, which is a whole different vibe. Uh, what what are you experiencing? You feel like this different than what you had before? It's actually been a little bit of a challenge for me, uh, you know, because the last restaurant job I came out of, like I said, was that super intense, like fine dining atmosphere. So kind of like shifting gears a little bit and backpedaling and like shifting down to a more a little more like casual uh, dining setting and just transitioning from that that client base as well. Right. Because the uh, people that live next to live next to and in cities don't necessarily like to eat like the people out here in the rural areas, you know what I mean? So th yeah, that's I've been, been a I challenge. looked at, I looked at like the pictures, um, on Facebook of the food and that, you know, it looks like you're doing some really delicious looking, uh, stuff. Um, I noticed you're having an Easter brunch coming up. Yep. You're doing like a murder mystery dinner. Things oh, like yep. That. Yep. We just did a murder mystery, a uh, couple, uh, beginning of February, uh, was our first one ton of fun. Uh, we had a great, great turnout and uh, we plan on doing um, a couple more next year. We're going to try to do two to three a year now. Uh, we, we enjoyed it so much. So our next one is February 1st next year and then uh, March 1st next year um, is what we're planning uh, for those. So um, what get like, for example, let's use the Easter brunch as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, what um, when you're preparing the brunch for folks who are obviously either staying there at the lodge or maybe people are coming in, you know, from their own uh, cabin or whatever that they're staying in. Uh, uh, what, what goes into philosophically when you're preparing the menu, you know, what's in your head? Oh, well, first of all, you know, obviously food cost is a big one. I've got to make sure that we're at least making enough money to sustain ourselves and, you know, repair things when they, when they break, uh, things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, what are, what are people around here going to eat? You know what I mean? I, um, I can't really, I can't come at them with a, a foie mousse, you know, things of that nature for, for brunch that might do very well in, in the city. But, you know, keeping it simple, biscuits and gravy, um, eggs Benedict, uh, you know, eggs your way. You know what I mean? Country breakfast. Try to keep it simple. You know, like Cracker Barrel. People love Cracker Barrel down here in the South. So, you know, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, as well as, you know, just trying to pull pull uh, from inspiration from my, you know, my journey, you know, places I've lived, I've got a, we've got a pancake dish on our brunch menu that is pretty much straight out of a, a breakfast restaurant I used to frequent in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and my time spent there, and, uh, things like that. 
What about uh, just your lifestyle of you? And I'm assuming, did you marry your fiance that you yeah, to yeah. in Nashville? Yep. So you're and now that, wife. Yeah. So you guys didn't look at the apartment burning down as a bad omen that, you know, that you should avoid. So good, good for you that you guys plowed ahead, got married. And then what's yeah. the, what's the lifestyle difference between, you know, vibing in Nashville versus, uh, I guess you're Henry County. Yep. Mm -hmm. Paris, Paris. Yep. So when you tell people you're a chef in Paris, I'm sure there's a, there's a joke after that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Oh, we, we, oh yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the, what's the social difference you found living you know, in one area like this versus another? Oh, it's so much. It's just way slower. And that's the easiest way to put it. The pace is just turned way down. You know, you're going from rabbit, to turtle it's really nice nashville was some of the worst traffic i'd ever experienced in my life so being rid of that um is great uh you know it's got its pros and cons everyone is super friendly here of course um you know uh really tight knit you know on the the weekends we spend a lot of the weekends in each other's backyards and whatnot um and but but you know on the downside, the talent pool is a little smaller, you know, when it comes to recruiting, recruiting uh, for a restaurant operation. Uh, so it makes training and development uh, more important, um, things of that nature. But I love it. I actually grew up in a rural area. Uh, I graduated from a high school. I think my graduating class was like 91 students. So real, well, and, real small um, town. You know, I think uh, your education the, the the mentors and the stuff you've learned in the past has to be really helpful for for the lodge for not just the kitchen but probably for the whole organization to be able to draw from that and learn from it 100 percent. you know i hear throughout every day i hear five or six different voices in the back of my head you know that have all coached me in a different way you know it's like a kung like a kung fu movie a movie <laughs> yeah yeah no that's great i'm the, i feel like i'm the same way I can absolutely understand that. So uh, because we're in tourism, um, I have a couple of uh, history things to share because I'm fascinated by that area. Zach, I'm sure you already know this, being a good Kentuckian. Um, do you, either of you know what Henry County's first tourist attraction was? Um, Is it the fish fry? I, That's, that was my guess, too. It did come along later. <laughs> oh, okay. The first uh, Henry County tourist attraction was the Sulphur Well, which was created by accident in 1821 when an artesian well of sulfur water was struck in an attempt to locate a large salt bed on a Chickasaw reservation. A hotel was built around it. Uh, uh, doctors came, people would come and soak and, you know, they thought there was medicinal qualities to the water that came out. Um, and so it was a big, uh, a big, interesting community developed around it until in 1944, it was covered up by the Tennessee Valley authorities, Kentucky Lake, which, you know, you, we, we now have a lodge there, but, but now the next time you look out there at Kentucky Lake, know that far down beneath the water are the remnants of the sulfur well and the hotel and, and wow. that kind of thing. I'm sure though they're not there anymore, but, um, so that's how, um, uh, Paris then after that became the capital city of Kentucky Lake and the world's biggest fish fry, uh, came along and it is now, uh, one of, if not the biggest festival in Tennessee. So there you go. There's a little bit right of on. Trivia for folks listening. Um, do you see when they have the world's biggest? Do you see an influx of of folks that's coming? Oh yeah, eat? oh yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. The town booms. Um, I believe it's the last week of April every year, um, and also you know parades. Uh, I think they have beauty pageant, uh, a fishing tournament for the kids, which is like right down the street from my house, and it's a little private lake. Uh, it's a great time. Yeah, time. that that's excellent. It sounds like you're um, having a ball and doing great work. Zach and I are going to be there for an event with the American Advertising Federation mm -hmm. in in a in a week or so. Next I'm week, forward, yep. yeah, I'm looking forward to getting to meet. Hopefully, you, will you be there that day? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, of good. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. 
Um, and uh, I've I go uh, I've been to the fish fry. Uh, John Watkins, who is our uh, ground director of grounds here at Discovery Park, lives in Paris, and took me over to the world's biggest fish fry uh, when we, early when we moved here, and uh, delicious catfish and hush puppies and French fry. So that was fun. Uh, but I have not yet been to the lodge, so I'm really excited and really looking forward to uh, getting to the lodge and checking it out. I know it's going to be cool. Excellent, man. Yeah, we're looking forward to having you. Yeah, it'll be a good time. So thank you uh, so much for being on the podcast. And um, if anybody's interested in visiting um, you guys, where should they go for more information? Uh, I believe it is Tennessee state parks.gov. Uh, I could be wrong on that. Uh, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And, and we'll also put a link down in the show notes. Um, and we'll, uh, you can also do what I did, which is Google, uh, Paris landing state park lodge, of and course. that pulls it up as well. Um, so I highly recommend the experience. And if somebody comes, I hope they, uh, what, what's the one thing they should order on the menu for sure when they come to visit you? I mean, our number one seller every season and never fails is the fried catfish. Okay. You know, so cornmeal breaded fried catfish on a bed of French fries served with, uh, with white beans. There you it, go. You heard it from chef Dylan Constantino, um, <laughs> order the fried catfish. Thank you, Dylan. Right. You're welcome. Thank oh you no, I should so say much. thank you, chef. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yes, chef. No problem. <laughs> Thanks to all you listeners who have joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.